and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome for Mr. Stuart Dybeck and Mr. Dominic Kasuba. Can everybody hear me? We're going to pass the mic. Okay. Oh, and just so everyone knows, there will be a Q&A at the end of the program, so a short Q&A, so that if, you ha if there's anything we don't cover, if there's anything you want to ask our authors, please feel free. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, for purposes of full disclosure, I am from the back of the yards, and so is Dominic. He lived a block and a half away from me, but I did not know him. Um, and that was because he was Polish, so he went to Sacred Heart. I was Lithuanian, I went to Holy Cross, and even though he's a lot older than me, um, <laughs> I still didn't know him. <laughs> I'm sure he had a reputation, though, but they wouldn't tell me <laughs> what it was. Um, so that's kind of uh, gives you an idea of what some of these neighborhoods were like. Um, there was a lot of segregation depending on what ethnic group you came from. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, but before we do that, let's talk about American Warsaw. Uh, Dominic, what prompted you to write it, and when did you begin writing it? Well, well, it's kind of interesting because I, as I often told my students, sometimes you pick a subject, other times the subject picks you. And uh, all my life, this subject has picked me. Uh, I grew up in the community. Um, as I grew older, I got more involved in Polish organizations. And uh, it has always been at the back of my head to write something about the history of the Chicago Polonia. And hopefully, uh, this is it, or uh, at least part of it. You know, I know there will be p people out there who will say, well, you didn't write about this, that, or, or whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, blame my editor. I only had 80,000 words. <laughs> um, well, when exactly did you start writing it? How many years ago was that? I'd say 400. <laughs> Basically, you know, I, I mean, I actually started writing it probably about, uh, let's see, the uh, Slaughterhouse book came out in 2015, so around 2015 I started to write it. It takes about four or five years to do a book, for me anyway. And, um, um, it, but, but really, it's, it's, if you think about it, I've been writing about Polonia, which is what we call the Polish community, uh, for, um, for the last 40 years. So a lot of these are compilations of things that I've been doing for some time. My first article came out in 1977. That was before all of you were born. And, um, uh, and that was on a, on, a, on a packing house strike of Polish workers in 1921-22. So I've been doing it for a long time. You mentioned um, in your acknowledgment someone by the name of Aloysius Majewski. Do you want to tell us a little bit about him and the, the impact that he had on you? Yeah. Al Majewski was a, a particularly important person in my life. Um, Back about 1971, 72, uh, I met a young woman whose name I'm sorry, I forget, uh, and she introduced me to Al Majewski. Um, she was of um, uh, Bielorusian descent, but was somehow involved in the Polish community as well. And um, Majewski talked, brought me in as to, to do a study uh, funded by uh, Nixon's White House, uh, and I was a, uh, young liberal Democrat, and Majewski was a older uh, conservative Republican, but he never, uh, never tried to shut me down. He, we always talked about things, we argued about things, he always let me do what I wanted to do, and I did several reports for him. Over the years he uh, supported my graduate studies. Uh, Majewski called me his house radical. 
So, so look out, you Bernie supporters. Uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, it was an interesting time because he was very very supportive of me. Uh, uh, Mr. Pshewski, who worked with him, and also Mr. Lukomski, they both worked for the Polish National Alliance, the Polish American Congress. Uh, as well, and Al was president of both those organizations. He was a great man, um, and uh, we miss him dearly. Now, Stuart, you grew up in the Pilsen area, correct? Um, tell us a little bit about um, your the, the times that you grew up in and what it was like growing up in a Polish neighborhood and the effect it had on you. Um, well, the effect it had on me. <laughs> I really love this, uh, this book that um, Dominic has brought out, uh, American Warsaw. And um, I'm a huge fan of all his work. And it's revelatory to me. I I'm, I'm really answering the question, but I'm kind of getting around to it. And it, one of the things about writing about the subject of Polonia is that uh, I never really, in, it, it wasn't a conscious choice. It just kind of happened. It was the world I grew up with. And it was also, I had the huge privilege of watching it change. The, the um, migration across the Rio Grande that were still uh, horrified by the after effects today with what's going on. Uh, it was in full gear, and I watched the um, bars um, change from polka bars to music that sounded very much like polkas. <laughs> I watched one virgin worshiping culture be replaced by another virgin worshiping culture. <laughs> And, uh, but, but all that never knowing that I would write a word about it. And when I began to write about it, um, th I think one of the themes I had was, what is it exactly I'm writing about? Because it was so foggy. So much of it was so distanced. So much of it was so inarticulate and inarticulatable, maybe that's the word I'm, I'm trying to find. And I, I, in some ways, I'm kind of thankful that Dominic's books weren't available to me because I wouldn't have had a theme. <laughs> when I read these books, I begin understanding the larger context and why things I saw through a child's eyes first, but growing up as well, seemed so mysterious to me. And. Um, Partly, um, I've written out of that sense of mystery. There is a line in um, Mary Wisniewski's book about Nelson Algren, and she says that she was referring to the Polonia that he was moving into, and the line was something to the effect of, it was like living in another country without leaving the country. Did you feel that, either of you? That there was so much tradition and so much well, yeah, I mean, I grew up a Pole. I felt I was a Polish. Um, and uh, everybody knew my, how to pronounce my name. <laughs> then I went to high school. And nobody knew how to pronounce my name. The real pronunciation is Patsiga. Everybody says Pasek at De La Salle Institute. I'm the only one, by the way, who has not run for mayor. Um, uh, they would call me Paycheck, Bakuga, Payaga, Pasiga, Gajaga. They just, you know, finally they just gave up and called me Dominic. Um, and, and that was okay, but it, it, was, it was kind of a shock because I was now in another world. Back in the yards, even the Mexicans knew I was Patsiga. I mean, it was really interesting. Even the Lithuanians, God bless them, don't get mad at me, uh, <laughs> knew I was Patsika. Uh, and it was, a, it, was a, it was sort of a complete world. Getting out of it was, was totally different. In 1980, and I mentioned this in the introduction to the book, I went to a conference in Toronto where I met a bunch of Polish historians, and they told me for the first time in my life, you're not Polish. I was shocked. 
What do you mean I'm not Polish? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, moving po Polsku, you know. And they said, well, you're not. You're born in America. You're an American. And it was a shock to me in a way, because in that strange Chicago way, you're not only American, but you're Polish or you're Lithuanian or you're German. I gave a talk at the German Day celebration the other day. Can you imagine that? And um, it went over very well. But you know, the idea that they celebrated their culture was part of what we did too, and still do. And I, and I think that's important. The thing that strikes me about Stewart's writing, so I'm, I, I've read much of it, uh, and uh, it strikes me how similar in some ways are, uh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna say your, your stories are based on your life because I know it's fiction and we'll, we'll go on beyond that, um, but how similar the experiences were just across the river in Pilsen <laughs> and just up the street in, in, Lawn, in South Lawndale. How, how similar the experiences were. I felt like I had a brother from another mother. You know, it was as we had much of the same things going on. What was that question? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was something well, about the foreignness. Do you feel like um, you were living in another country? Oh, do I feel like I was living in another country? Uh, yes and no. Mm -hmm. The my experience in Chicago was that everybody was living in another country. Yeah. That is, on our way to Maxwell Street, where we went every Sunday. By we, I mean me and my dad. Um, I, I realized that if I went to Maxwell Street with him on Sunday, I didn't have to go to church. <laughs> and. and a church was interesting in its way, but I mean, it was no, you couldn't get a pork chop sandwich there, you know. <laughs> and uh, there was nobody playing blues guitar, no gypsies. Yeah. I have a scene in, in, a, in a story where my dad and I are in Maxwell Street and I, I'm looking in the, through the curtains uh, where the gypsies have set up a little place on, on, in a storefront and a gypsy girl comes out, maybe not that much older than me, and she walks right up to him and grabs him by the crotch. <laughs> and there's this standoff. <laughs> and he turns and says, <laughs> he gives me this look like, don't tell mom. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, a cop comes walking across the street, and she lets him go in. But I, I mean, things like that didn't happen at church. <laughs> But on the way to Maxwell Street, depending on what route he chose to go, we might have gone through Greek Town if he wanted to pick something up. We would certainly have driven through Chinatown. We, we, we would have gone, if we'd have gone down Western Avenue, the entire St. Michael's, one of the two St. Michael's parishes in Chicago, which was entirely Italian. Part of it is still left on Oakley Avenue. So in other words, I, I didn't exactly feel that there was anything unique in, in the ethnicity that I was growing up in, because all I had to do was cross this border, that border, this other border, and uh, and and I'm I'm leaving out the Irish, but I, I, um, I it was a, a very ethnic. I mean, I, Irish in Chicago is a is not just some kind of Anglo. Um, it, it's it's a real ethnic community. And so um, my experience of the city was a, a city of cells, uh, um, not jail cells, but. <laughs> you could tell. Yeah. You could tell if it was a jail cell. We want to hear that story. <laughs> um, what about the politics of the time? I mean, there was a lot going on, whether it was you know uh, the city, but there was also so much going on in Poland. Um, once again, this is for both of you. Were you aware of, what, first of all, the city politics? Did peop people in your neighborhood get involved in it? And were you aware of what was going on in Poland? You could start. I was, but it was so shadowy because it had no context. A lot of it sounded, my, um, my father who was born in Poland, um, It was only after his death that I found out he may have been Jewish. His, in, when I went to Krakow and um, met Dominic Dybek, who was the head rabbi at the Temple Izaka. And 
I, I knew so, I, I had such little understanding. I, w one of the things I should add to this right away, is because I think it'll make more sense to all of you. Um, why do you think, try to imagine you're growing up on the streets of Pilsen, and all your buds are named Jimmy, and Juan, and Mikey, and your name is Stuart? <laughs> That name has no street cred. <laughs> Thank God my name was pronounced the right way, Dibek, and so everybody called me Dibs. And I finally went to my father one day, whose name was Stash, and I said, Dad, why did you name me Stuart? And he said, well, it was that or Scott. They're both good business names. <laughs> What it really means is they're both names for assimilation. So my, you know, my point is that m my parents were really not bending over backwards to invite me into what remnants they were able to have traveled um, from uh, Poland uh, with. And so when, um, when uh, Dominic Dybek uh, said to me in Krakow, uh, you're, you're Jewish, right? When he found out what my name was, and I said, no, 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 I grew up, I went to Catholic schools, I grew up Catholic, my parents were Catholic. He said, well, where was your father from? And with great authority, I said, Yelezhna. I had not a clue where the hell Yelezhna was. And he said, it's a shuttle, 20 kilometers away, all Jews. So my, the, the um, going back to that whole notion of growing up in something that was at the center of your heart, but at the same time was really mysterious, it's an interesting uh, collision in a human being. Um, that, that's, those are kind of the sources that it came from. One thing, one last thing I wanted to add to the other question was about, uh, uh, so I, I thought the whole world was, was divided into these ethnic cells growing up in Chicago. And what was really foreign for me was Mick Mick Chicago. A American culture that was McDonald's, that was TV programs where people grow up in suburbs that I know didn't even exist. And the, 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 for me, the real world was ethnicity. And it was not necessarily Polish ethnicity. It, it was the life that was throbbing in all these different ethnic neighborhoods. Dominic. Ditto. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I grew up in back of the yards uh, with my friend Sandra here. And there were 14 Catholic churches in two square miles. That's better than Rome, okay? <laughs> On Holy Thursday, we used to be able to go to like six churches walking around the block, basically. <laughs> Her church, Holy Cross, was just up the street from where I live, but there was Sacred Heart, and there was St. Michael's, which was a Slovak. There was the Czech Church, Five Holy Martyrs. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, St. Cyril and Methodius. And don't mix those two together, because the Czechs and Slovaks did not like each other that much. There was a German church, St. Augustine. Uh, there were Irish, a couple of Irish churches. We had a church called St. Rosa Lima. Uh, everybody else would have said Rose of Lima, but in back of the yards, it was one word, Rosa Lima. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, and so there were all these 14 different Catholic churches. So I, I agree with, you know, uh, what Stuart says is that we were divided into these little like cells, basically, in, in, in many ways. Where, where, you know, we've barely crossed uh, the line. Uh, I remember as a young boy, I was 16 years old, uh, I, I uh, uh, had a crush on a Lithuanian girl who lived next door. And I asked her out, and she said, I have to ask my mother. So she talks to her mother, and her mother slapped her in the face and said, no Polakos. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, my mother said, what are you, crazy, going out with a Lithuanian girl? What are you, nuts? We lived next to each other, and by the way, my mother and her mother were friends. <laughs> but, you know, there were these walls, you know. Uh, and, I, and I think that, that that's exactly right. Um, so you, you, you're right. It's it's both it's both familiar and unfamiliar. It's 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 
like separate world, but it's not. Uh, Chicago was such a place. Now, much of that has gone away because we've all become assimilated, moved to the suburbs, and you know, have air conditioning, uh, so we don't talk to each other anymore, and then we're on the internet. But it's it's interesting to see how uh, that world. So when I tell my children about this. They sometimes look at me like I grew up with Fred Flintstone, you know? Like, when did you grow up? 18 what? You know? Uh, uh, but that's how Chicago was well into the 1960s, I think it was that way. Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 and then, you know, all of a sudden there, were all, there was this new Catholic group that moved in, the Mexicans, right? And, and it was, uh, it was uh, interesting. And, and we didn't, you know, now everybody talks about race and so we didn't think about race. It was just another ethnic group that moved in. And, and there was hostility sometimes between us because it was another ethnic group moving in and you just did that. Uh, but it was, uh, uh, um, it was a time. We had, to quote Jerry Garcia, it was, a, it was quite a trip. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what about the politics of the area? Uh, yeah. Well, politics were often very much ethnically based, of course. Uh, of course, in the back of the yards, we had Republicans who were, de who were Polish and Democrats who were Polish, and they fought it out a little bit. Uh, but of course, there was always that great Irish god that pulled himself up in Bridgeport, you know, and looked down upon us. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, yes, that would be him. Uh, <laughs> The old man, not not the kid. Yeah. Okay, but the uh, I I, re I met him the first time when I was nine years old. He shook my hand as he was opening up the Damon overpass. Yes, I that. He opened. I was there. And, he, and you were there yes. too. Yeah. And uh, I was I probably had a crush on you yes. at that time. And but your mother wouldn't let me go out with you. But anyway, <laughs> um, he shook my hand and it was like, oh my God, who was this sort of magisterial person who had shook my hand? But I mean, as as getting up earl older and older, of course, getting involved in not. In so much involved in politics, but learning more and more about it. Uh, when, when, you know, I, we used to, Vito Marzullo, right, who probably was your alderman, right? You know, we used to go to Wojniak's Grove on uh, Blue Island, uh, you know, uh, to, to, for the Polish, I'm a, I'm a Gural, I'm a Polish mountaineer. So the Polish mountaineers would crown their queen every year at Wojniak's Grove, because he was a Gural. And so we'd have these big parties and picnics and polka dancing, you know. But that place, which is now long gone, knocked down, had murals of politicians and, and Poland all over the walls. It was, it was almost like going through a history uh, lesson, just walking through the place. So the, these things were very important for all of us. But I have to tell you, um, as much as I loved Kugula, Kugula did not love me. Kugula is a potato. Uh, Kugulis. Kugulis, excuse me. Pardon my Lithuanian. Yeah. Uh, a, a really uh, uh, a treat. But it, it was, uh, it, it, there were those divisions. And of course, because I went to a Catholic grammar school, everybody in my grammar school was Polish, right? They were all Polish. There was like one kid with a name named Flynn. But his mother, his mother was Polish. So, you know, we let, we let him in, you know. But, but, you know, you talk about being Stuart. Try being Dominic, you know? I think my mother named me Dominic so she'd see if I could survive, you know? Well, I can remember my grandmother um, and, and her being Lithuanian, um, but the, the strife and all the things going on in Europe, she was always making care packages and sending things over to, to Europe. Um, I don't know how much they knew because American television was so different. Mm -hmm. They didn't, but somehow the word got through that there was troubles in Poland and Lithuania. And did did you were you aware of anything like that growing up as far as the the ethnic strife in Europe? Was it talked about? Well, it was talked about in the church. The um, the whole Iron Curtain and Cold War. Um, I was, um, I think, magnified in a Polish neighborhood. I, I'm not saying that it was totally limited to, to uh, it, it, the, the entire country was obsessed with the Cold War and the whole notion that we were, were capable of turning Chicago into another Hiroshima. But um, the in 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 a Polish neighborhood. That was kind of doubled because of the history and conflict which this book that um, Dominic wrote beautifully details between 
um, Poland caught between Germany and Poland caught with Germany on one side and Russia on the other. And so um, the G Germany side kind of worked itself out in my uncles and stuff during World War II. When I grew up, I grew up in the Cold War era. And um, in, in the neighborhood, it, it seemed like a conflict, not just between the United States and the Soviet Union, but between Poland and the Soviet Union. We would pr pray for the death of Stalin. <laughs> yeah, I seem to remember praying for the death of Stalin, yes. Um, one of the things, well, first of all, do, when you were writing this, were there a lot of surprises? When I was reading it, there were a few. I think one of the things that surprised me was the friction within the Polish community. If you want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, the Polish community, which to outsiders seemed very united, was very divided. <laughs> there, were, there were two things Poles like. Parades, and to argue with each other about who's a better pole. <laughs> and, and we did that constantly uh, throughout our history. And in my book, I talk about the, the, the dar argument between the Polish Roman Catholic Union and the Polish National Alliance over the idea of polskość, which means what does it mean to be a pole? How, what does Polishness mean? Well, Polishness to the Polish Roman Catholic Union meant that you had to be a Roman Catholic and speak Polish. Pretty straightforward. To the Polish National Alliance, it meant you had to believe in Poland. If you were a Jew and believed in Poland, that was fine. If you were an atheist and believed in Poland, that was fine. If you were a Lutheran, and there were a lot of Lutheran Poles, that was fine. If you were Orthodox Christian and believed in Poland, that was fine. So, you know, the Polish National Alliance, the symbol of the Polish National Alliance is the Polish eagle, uh, the Lithuanian uh, horseman, and the Ukrainian uh, angel. So because they saw this as all part of Poland. Polish lands at one time had reached far into Russia, uh, what is today Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, and they wanted the resurrection of that Polish state, which was once the largest country in Europe. That didn't happen, and, it, and because nationalism, you know, so you had Lithuanian nationalism and Belarusian nationalism and Ukrainian nationalism and, 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 and Zionism, as well as German nationalism, of course, uh, raise its head. And so this became a, a very big argument. But the Polish National Alliance said, you know, if you believe in Poland, you're, you're a Pole. And that's fine. Let's move on. Uh, the Polish Roman Catholic Union did not. And that led to a division in the community that lasted a very long time. And to an extent, there's still the afterglow of that between the two, uh, two organizations. So what does it mean to be Polish? Uh, you know, in my, I, I grew up in the back of the yards. My grandmother, uh, uh, her house, her apartment, she'd never owned a house. Her apartment, her four rooms, uh, was the center of my life, right? That and the Catholic Church just down the block, and of course, Goldblatt's. Uh, well, come on, you gotta buy underwear someplace. So, <laughs> so uh, but my grandmother's green kitchen is what reminds me the most about being Polish, because that was the most Polish place in the world, was my grandmother's, where she sat on a chair as the queen and, uh, you know, ordered us all around. And, and she, was, she was a loving, beautiful woman uh, who, uh, who uh, you know, I, I used to sleep over and I would hear, uh, maybe some of you remember Marysia Data, she would sing in the morning with yodel, it was first thing, it was six o'clock in the morning. She would yodel on the radio, my grandmother would play up loud to wake me up to go to church because I was an altar boy and I had to go every day, you know. <laughs> Gee, Stuart, I wish I'd gone to, you know, Maxwell Street. Uh, but anyway, and by the way, I found out years later that my great great grandmother's name was Sarah Goldin. So we probably are cousins. Uh, but it's, 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 what's interesting about all of this was how much it was just part of family life. I, it, it didn't seem exotic to me in any kind of way. It just seemed it was just a natural thing. And the fact that your family was Lithuanian was a natural thing. And, and it, just, it, it was just something that happened. One of the things which you, you mentioned in your book, um, speaking of being Lithuanian, there's a phrase about you, they chose their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Because um, I am, and this is so weird, um, I'm one quarter Polish, and I didn't know this until 15 years ago. I was told I was Lithuanian, and on my father's side, they were Slovak, that's all I knew. 
And then 15 years ago, my aunt on my father's side says, well, don't you know that your grandmother is Polish? And, no, it, it was hidden because there was so much hostility mm -hmm. between the Lithuanians and the Polish. So the two grandmothers never got along. So I never knew there was Polish. Sure. It, it, it was just one of the strange things. But um, if you could speak a little about choosing your ethnicity, it's an interesting comment. Well, I, I think, you know, most of those of us who grew up in fairly strong ethnic backgrounds, you don't really feel like you've chosen anything. But frankly, and this is going to be surprising, I'm white. Um, and I can choose to be American. I could change my name to Dominic Smith or John Smith, right? Um, I can blend in. Uh, I don't have to be Catholic. I can be something else. Um, so people make a choice to an extent. What are you going to be? Um, and if you come from a mixed family, and that means, God bless you if you're half Irish, uh, <laughs> I have to control myself, um, that uh, indeed uh, you make a choice. And it's usually the choice revolves around the mother. Right? It's usually around the mother. Um, or you make a choice not to be either one. You go off and I think one of your short stories talks about a woman who moves beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the new book, Chicago, Chicago Bound, Bound 2, two. Time yeah, moves beyond it, moves to Los Angeles yeah. and so forth. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lovely story. I, I, you should read it. Um, but it, it, the idea is just you have a choice. I could have easily changed my name or just said Pasiga is Armenian, who cares, right? Whatever. Uh, it, it was, it was a, it, it's a choice. My, you know, I'm the only one of all the grandchildren that spoke Polish. Uh, you know, it, oh, I'm sorry, I had an older cousin who also spoke Polish, but she died very early. So, I mean, it, it sort of disappeared in my generation, as it often does, that language connection. Uh, but for me, and, and it probably goes back to that green kitchen that my grandmother wore where she was queen uh, sitting on her chair all day, um, uh, it, it, that was probably a big part of it. Did you find the women um, in your growing up and in your neighborhood probably the most dominant influences? Uh, the, my grandmother, my busha was the, on my mother's side, was the center of my life. and. Uh, that remains a center for me today. I want to just take a step back and, and um, go off something uh, that Dominic just uh, was talking about, choice. And that's that um, one of the things that growing up in a working class, because we're, we haven't really talked about class, we're talking entirely about ethnicity, but for me they're kind of hard to separate. But one of the things that about growing up in a working class ethnic neighborhood family is that when you step out into however you want to define America, to leave it to Beaver, McDonald's, all, all the kind of American movies, um, rock and roll, all, all the wonderful things and a lot of the shallow things about um, uh, uh, the most powerful country in the world. Uh, one of the things that gives you a choice is to have a viable alternative in your mind already. So I've taught for a zillion years, and one of the things that happens from time to time is I'll say to the kids, you know, write about place. They're everybody, I, I get these stories from undergrads in college, and, and the story takes place in a town that has no name. They go to a school that doesn't have a name. And the, the, the whole notion in, in writing is you want to make things immediate and concrete. And, and that's where universi univ universality comes from. It, so a lot of times they'll say, I'll say, your, your town doesn't have a name. Yeah, but that's because I want everybody to feel that that's a universal town. Well, that's not how it works. Just the opposite. And then they'll say, well, you know, you, and, and I'll say, and, and do you have any ethnicity? And um, the thing is that one of the things that the students frequently complain about is that they don't. It's gone. We have the mall to write about. You had this family, you had this neighborhood, Poles, Mexicans, et, et, 
et cetera, et cetera. We don't have that. We got TV, we got our cell phones. And the, what I think what they're saying is we, alternatives that we have, we've seen, we've read about, we don't have them, we didn't live them. And that for me, for making a choice, it's a lot easier to make a choice if you've lived that alternative and you've lived what you want that alternative to be a choice too. So in other words, we're the gazers that everybody has to go to to hear the stories no, I, about I the olden days. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I think the city and, and my student body is, is, is enormously ethnic. It's just that it's different ethnicity. So for instance, we call Asians, Asians. It's ridiculous. It would be like calling, it would be like having this conversation in which we're all calling ourselves Europeans. Well, in my European neighborhood, there's, there's Vietnamese, there's all kinds of people from different kinds of China, that, different places in China. There's Koreans, they, they don't regard each other as one thing, an Asian. So that, that, that sense of ethnicity still exists really profoundly, and same thing in the Hispanic world. Just because you're Hispanic, it doesn't mean that a Mexican is the exact same, is, you, you know, so they're, they're, those cells still exist, it's just in, a, in different racial configurations. You know, I always used to ask my students, uh, when I, was, I, I stopped teaching two years ago, but I would ask them, when they'd say, oh, we're not ethnic, I'd say, well, what do you do at Christmas? How many of you hide a pickle in the tree? And the kids named Schultz and uh, so forth would say, oh yeah, we would hide a pickle in a tree, you know, that's German. Who eats, you know, op who has passes the opwatek on, on Christmas Eve? Those are the Polish kids. It's still kept on in the traditions, they're still there, but it's been, it's been papered over to an extent. It has sort of, to an extent, disappeared because it's, it's beyond the immigration, except for the latest immigrants. The latest immigrants, of course, but that's sort of like they were my grandparents, right? They're, they're now come in later. Uh, but I, I think it's still important in the way we, you know, uh, the two groups in Chicago that intermarry the most are the Poles and the Mexicans. Now, why is that? Well, two virgins, Our Lady Guadalupe and Our Lady Częstochowa. Uh, but more than that, it's the way we interact with our siblings and our parents, which is very, very similar. So the Czechs and the Poles and the Mexicans and all intend to intermarry. And I, I said Czechs because we've got a Czech-Mex couple right here. <laughs> but uh, the idea here is that, that there was this sort of inter interaction between these two groups. And even though they didn't like each other, right? The Mexicans moved in. They were strike breakers. They called it terrible. You know, uh, but the kids said, yeah, she's kind of cute. You know, uh, and, uh, and 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 we intermarried a lot, and I think that that uh, that is part of it. Uh, and uh, whether on Christmas they have uh, the, the day before Christmas they have Taco Day or no, well, I'm sorry, Tamale Day, right? Where they make tamales or where do they make pierogies the night before? Uh, it's usually because which one is the mother? <laughs> because you know, Mama knows best. Forget that, Daddy. The father knows best stuff. It's not true. It's very true that the women were more dominant, yeah. more dominant, more influential. Uh, let's turn this over to some questions and answers. If you want to step up in front, if you've got a question. Yeah. Yeah. We can't see you. I just, like, have a loud voice. I can just... It is being recorded, so if you could use the mic, that would help. Yeah. Um, there's a book, Studies of Greek Americans, by, I think his name is Kurvataris, Kurtavaris, and he draws a distinction. He talks about the assimilation of the Greek Americans, and he divides the process from the Dionysian celebratory aspects of the culture to the more Apollonian. And I know a lot of our ethnic um, attachments are towards food and dance and music, but can you talk about those aspects that are perhaps more sober? Like, no, I don't mean, I don't mean, I don't mean to be funny. I mean, sort of character about the Polish character or the Lithuanian character, and what does that mean uh, in the context of assimilation in the in American culture? You know, food, 
music and famous people are always three sort of landmarks of any ethnic group, you know. Uh, so for, for the Poles, Kosciuszko and Pulaski, of course, because they were fought in the American Revolution and this became very important and this made us more American than Americans, right? Um, but, you know, in food, I mean, I, I say in the book, scratch, scratch a Chicago one and ask them, you know, if they know what the difference between pierogi and kielbasa and 90% of you do. Okay, so food and, 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 and celebration and, and music, uh, I mean, I grew up with Little Wally. I don't know if you know who Little Wally was, but Little Wally Agello actually married uh, Polka Jeanette, who lived behind me on Walcott Street. She lived in the same building, but so Little Wally would come up in his big car and take Polka Jeanette out to, you know, to date, and uh, then they eventually got married. And, and but, what's that? Mawevaju, yes, and Mawevaju also uh, made a, a f and him and Polka Jeanette made a fortune with JJ Records. But anyway, um, uh, and and he wrote that famous White Sox song, "Go Go White Sox," um, and I'm a Sox fan, so you know I play it every day. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Well, where was I going with this? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that there are, are, are other things. I think, you know what happens in, 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 in almost instinctively? There's a first generation that migrates, and many of them want to become American and just, you know, they name the kid Stuart or they name the kid Dominic, and they try to push them into something else. Uh, and that, that first generation that's born here, and then the second or third generation reflects back on their lives and they say, well, where did I come from? I, I worry about the rootlessness of some Americans, you know, that they don't know where they're from. Or they, you ask a kid, well, what part of Europe were you from? Or what part of Latin America? Or what part of Asia? And I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Well, there's kind of a rootlessness, and I, I've tried with my children, you know, I've taken them back to places that we're from, my wife is Italian and I'm Polish, and we go back to the villages and so forth. And I think that that's an important part of trying to at least have some rootedness, because I think at times you get easily lost in the, the flashy internet world that we live in now, and you forget your, your roots, and, I, and, and they're there. A lot of people still look for the pickle in the tree. Do you want to add to this? Yeah, I, I think that the question is really interesting, and um, the and but the um, response to it to start uh, singling out um, possibly stereotyped qualities doesn't take into account that we're talking about American poles, mm -hmm. we're talking about American Italians. When you're talking about Greeks, especially if you've been to Greece. That culture is so, still so close. All that stuff about gods and everything that are just kind of fairy tale stories when you're an American kid. When you go to Greece, they're still there. I don't mean that everybody's walking around praying to Hermes. But I mean that, 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 that prior culture was so powerful, and I, I don't think it's necessarily all positive, although I, it's one of my favorite places in the world to go to visit. So, to as an American, part Czech, part Pole, maybe part Jewish, for all I know. I don't. I mean, I'm not even sure. But I, I, I don't. I don't really feel like I can. I can legislate about things like that. The the whole point of being an American is that um, what you can talk about is being an American. Is there another question somewhere? There we go. That's an excellent segue actually to my question, which was you grew up in what you took to be Polishness, but you've both been to Poland. And so my question is, how did that feel when you came to that root place where your culture was from, and the differences and similarities of the Polishness that you grew up in? Very good question. Um, the first time I went to Poland was 1986. Uh, martial law had just been uh, you know, done away with. And solidarity was on the rise. And, uh, I went to visit the village my grandparents were from, my mother's parents, and my, my father's parents is in a nearby village. Um, it, it was very emotional for me. Um, 
in a lot of ways, it, it was still a communist regime, so it was a little weird. I landed in Warsaw, and the Warsaw Airport was still sort of a semi-military airport, you know. And the, the guard who asked me why I was coming, I said, I'm very happily in Polish. I said, well, you know, I'm giving a lecture on, on, at the Jagiellonian University, the most famous university in Poland. And I was very proud. I was the first person in my family to come back. And, and uh, he said, what are you going to lecture on, doctor? And I said, oh, on the American working class. And his eyes lit up. He says, you know, we're a communist country, so we're very interested in the working class. And I said, oh, well, that's great. Um, you know. So I went to get my bags, and a little apparatchi came out and whispered in the ear of this woman who was, you know, checking your passport. And when I came up, she stopped me. She said, open your bags. I opened my bags. She took out. She says, why do you have books? I says, well, they're gifts to the Polish University, to the Jagiellonian. She said, we have books in Poland. We don't need capitalist books. <laughs> then she found a map, uh, which was given to me by the tourist organization in Poland. And I had circled various things I wanted to see in Krakow. Uh, the castle, you know, the Lenek, uh, which is the marketplace, etc. She says, why do you have points of interest circled on a map? Well, what are you planning to do to those places? <laughs> now I'm getting nervous. <laughs> Two guys come out with AK-47s and stand behind them. And they're young men, and they're just, you know, they've just got that certain kind of military look, you know. And they're, they're standing there, and I'm like, oh, holy, excuse my language, shit. Uh, and then the apparatchik comes out and says, he looks at the books and he says, this is only history. It's not important. Tell them to go. <laughs> but, oh, by the way, in between that, my Polish is not that good. And I started to stutter, and I started to lose my Polishness. And I, and I, I basically, I grew up talking, as we say, Poshikagosku, in the Chicago manner. You know? So it was, you take an English word, you put a Polish ending on it. You know? <laughs> and now she says to me, she says, isn't that interesting? Five minutes ago, you spoke perfect English. Maybe now you speak CIA. I said, oh my god. So, so she, she starts yelling at me to pack my bag. She had thrown my underwear everywhere and everything. So I, I threw it all in a bag, as, in the bag as quick as I could. I closed it. These two guys escorted me out with the AK-47s. When we got past the gate, they both started to laugh and they said, welcome to People's Poland. <laughs> they said, everything's going to be OK now. Just have a cup of coffee and calm down. <laughs> so that was my first, first day. Since then, it's been much better. <laughs> it's been great. Uh, but it, it, and you know, I always felt, I, I feel that my, my second home is Krakow, um, even though I'm from the mountains, which is a little bit away. Uh, Krakow, I, I've always felt at home in Krakow. And uh, I studied there for, I, I'm sorry, I taught there for a year at, at the Aguilonian and a Fulbright. Um, and people were very loving and very caring and, 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 and very welcoming. And the fellow who told me I wasn't a Pole, when I came to teach in Krakow, he hugged me and he said, welcome home. Oh and it was like, oh my god. <laughs> Stuart. Uh, it was revelatory for me to, to um, go to, um, it was in Eastern Europe. The first place I went was Central Europe. Uh, I, I, I've taught for the last 20 years during the summer in the Czech Republic in Prague. And I, I, my grandmother, one of my grandmothers on my father's side was half Czech. But um, this, I guess I'm, this is kind of the theme for me for the evening is that how, how little I really understood about anything growing up. And um, one, one um, common thing that people who go to Prague for the first time uh, say is they look up at the castle and they look up at the labyrinthine streets and they and they say, "Geez, Kafka didn't make any of that up. <laughs> he just he just wrote like this is it." Well, for me, it wasn't. I mean, I had that same Kafka take, but it was. I saw these guys walking around with mismatched ties, high water pants. <laughs> And I saw where the entire fashion notion of my neighborhood came from. <laughs> there were there were all these bars and everybody drinking beer and I it was I just I had I mean I guess it's partly how dumb I was but I just didn't realize how hard 18th and Blue Island had tried to look 
like pride. <laughs> they didn't they didn't accomplish it, but they they got far enough into it that you you know, going back to your other question, when you left the neighborhood, you, you knew people were dressing in a different way. The, fa the whole fashion sense, the, um, all, all the things that I just took to be a Chicago ethnic diet. Um, you know, here I was at home with people who loved duck beyond all things. <laughs> so it was, it, it, I, I, it just was, was such a um, full body sense, such a physical sense of where, where, grow, where, what was trying to be emulated in the world that I grew up in. Okay, we have a question back here, Mary. Uh, Mary's the author of the uh, biography of Nelson Algren, so. Okay. Hi, um, I'm also second generation Polish, and, and when, when I went back to Poland, I was just amazed at how everyone looked like us, you know? <laughs> like, there's Cousin Rick. Um, but I wanted to ask, so many of the people in, in my family, uh, in parts of my family, are, have kind of gone along with the current line of being viciously anti-immigrant. And I know this is not a new thing, but I wanted to ask, is it worse than it used to be, or is it just a repeat of some of the anti-immigrant uh, positions that we've seen in the past? Do you want to? Sure. Well, you know, Samuel Gumpers, head of the AFL, was an immigrant. And he tried to pass anti-immigrant legislation in the 1890s to stop immigrants from coming in, because he felt it was competition over jobs. In hard times, people become anti-immigrant. And uh, while I know the economy is the biggest and the greatest and the worst, best it's ever been, <laughs> and, and we're led by you know a man of wisdom, um, but, but uh, things, times have not recovered yet. And I think that partially this was you know uh, uh, over jobs. Uh, that's part of it. But you know there's more to it than that. What happens, I think, is when people become assimilated, they get assimilated to a certain kind of culture. And they get assimilated sometimes to this feeling of that, well, immigrants are different from us and they shouldn't be here. Uh, and I've always told my students, remember, remember what Franklin Roosevelt said when he uh, uh, spoke to the daughters of the American Revolution. He says, we are all immigrants. He was of Dutch, English, background. He says, we're all immigrants. You are immigrants. None of us came here. None of us were belong here. And, and that was kind of interesting. And, and it always struck me um, that that is something that we all need to remember. So, uh, you know, immigrants play a, a crucial role in American society. And, I, and, I, and some of you may disagree with me, but they are central to the economic development of this country, to the cultural development. Uh, people like Albert Einstein, you know, he did not grow up in New Jersey. Um, people like, uh, um, you know, the Dailies were from Ireland, you know. Uh, and uh, here's a dirty little secret. They were originally from Brooklyn, and then they came to Chicago. <laughs> My wife's from Brooklyn, so it's okay. But, uh, you know, but uh, so, you know, we are all people on the move. And people all over the world, over all time, have been on the move. You know, in Poland, it was a Celtic nation before it became a Slavic nation. The Slavs pushed the Celts out. I, I, I tell my students this, you know, I, I have a, 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 a newspaper uh, that talks about Humboldt Park is the most beautiful suburb of Chicago. It's from the 1870s. And uh, it's half in German and half in English. And why are the Germans moving to Humboldt Park? Because we're moving in to Milwaukee Division in Ashland. And they're getting out of St. Boniface as fast as they can to stay away from these Poles. Now why do the Poles, Poles move to Humboldt Park? Because the Puerto Ricans and the Mexicans are moving into Milwaukee Division in Ashland. And why do the Puerto Ricans move to Humboldt Park? Because the damn yuppies are moving in. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when you see a fern bar, that's an ethnic bar. That's, that's, that's their bar. Okay? It doesn't say Gino Piva or uh, Cerveza Fria on it. It says, you know, wine. Get out of there as soon as you can. <laughs> and now the same is happening to Pilsen. So, you know, demographic change, once it begins, I, I'm 
not sure how this started, but I'm on a roll. Um, it really is hard to stop. Uh, and now uh, your kids are moving back to downtown. What's that about? You know, uh, my kids are moving back to downtown. Uh, my daughter actually now lives on 18 Wood Street, around the corner from St. Adelbert's, uh, which, uh, you know, where Stewart grew up, and uh, which I, my grandmother used to send me to 18th and Ashland to the drugstore on the corner of which, uh, Hovich, I think it was, uh, to buy um, herbs and uh, herbs and various kinds of things from the Polish druggists. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 as a historian, change happens and, and change continues, and, and some of us resent change, and I think that's what a lot of this is about. And some of us just resent change. Uh, I, I, I just like to say that Mexicans and Guatemalans and Ecuadorians are going to be assimilated just as much as people with unpronounceable names like Patsika and Divek are going to have become assimilated. And some of them, 50 years, might be sitting up here as old men talking about their writing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say much beyond that because he, um, I agree with so much of what Dominic just said. And he said it so well. I love the notion that we're all, we're all in motion. Uh, but I, I do want to add one little specific thing, and that's that when you have a politician who is using scapegoating in order to try to bring some sense of unity to one portion of the government, it, it rings so much of um, fascism where you have scapegoats, and that, that's part of, part of how you uh, manipulate people that, that I, I find that pretty terrifying. So. Here's, a, here's, a, here's a question here. My question relates to a question uh, asked by this gentleman behind me about character, the Polish character. So character frequently leads to characterization, and from there you can go on to stereotypes. So for example, uh, we have a friend who is a PhD professor at University of Chicago. She has gone to do her laundry, and tenants in her condo building have said to her, oh, you must have a lot of work. We really like like Polish cleaning ladies. <laughs> On the other hand, if you ever owned a house and you get proposals and they tell you you're going to have European craftsmen, for sure you can be bet that there's going to be Polish workers in that group. So I'm giving an example of positive and negative for stereotypes and characterizations. And I'm wondering if either um, of you two have experienced that in your line of work, either here in Chicago or in the United States? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, Polonia came as a working class community. And I think we, we, we haven't talked much about class, but that, that is a big part of this. You know, and, and the fact that we were always working class people to a large part, or at least into the larger framework. There, there were always intellectuals, there were always journalists, there were always writers. Um, but uh, uh, generally speaking, we had the, the you know, came in at the bottom of the ladder. And I think that stereotype has maintained itself. And sometimes the media maintains that stereotype as well. Um, but, you know, not every Mexican is a gardener. Uh, not every Mexican cuts your grass. Not every black person is a criminal. Uh, there are stereotypes for every one of them, right? Uh, you know, when, when Trump got up there and said, oh, they're all rapists and murderers and, you know, they're coming across the border. That's, excuse my language, bullshit. Oh, that's his language, never mind. Uh, but the, the fact remains that uh, this is very, very important to understand that these stereotypes are just stereotypes. Uh, they move beyond that. So there's been a great deal of upward mobility in Polonia, and, uh, and, and, it, and uh, it, it continues. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, and our two authors need to sign their books. Did you have a real quick question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. One more question. Yeah, we got it question. right here. Have you been confronted with this postmodern idea when you were teaching of students having safe places and having identities? And, and what do you, I mean, how do you um, relate that to what you've experienced? And when you've talked about ethnicity, I mean, how does that, what do you, how do you confront that or relate to that or respond to them? Nope. <laughs> Dominic? Uh, 
Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, I mean, I, I, as, a, as, a, as a professor, um, both of us teach universities, or did, I did, uh, and he does. Um, I think you have to respect that, and you have to try to deal with it as best as you can. You have to be understanding. And uh, you have to, uh, well, uh, you know, when a student comes up to you and says, I'm, I'm not sure what, what, what kind of orientation you're talking about, but, you know, I've had to be, walk the line with various students. And, and you, you do your best because you're there to not judge, you're there to teach. Um, and, uh, and I wish Sister Placidia had known that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think, I think that that's very really important. There's several of us here that are university professors. And I think we're confronted with those kinds of issues all the time, whether they are uh, ethnic issues or gender issues or class issues. Um, the way I always reflected on it to my students was that I was a kid whose people, who nobody could pronounce my name, and who was a very bad student. Uh, and I made it, and they can make it too, no matter what they are. I guess that's the only thing I can say. If I understood your question completely, I may not have. Any parting comments, Stuart? No. No. Great. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful panel. And the Midland. <laughs> Midland authors are very grateful for your participation and your time. So you all get this beautiful Midland authors mug. Oh my gosh. And a certificate that thanks you. And it's also good for a free one year membership in the Midland authors. But I just so, my dues. Well, this will extend it beyond that. Yeah. So, so thank you very much. And please pick up a book on your way out. Sign up for the mailing list. And I hope to see you at another event very soon. Thank you.